Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. Today in the shop we have a 1954 Victoria Bergmeister V35. Uh, this bike was purchased by a client of mine out of a private collection in California. Uh, the bike was cosmetically and mechanically restored a number of years ago. The bike had about, according to the odometer that appears to be reset, uh, has about four miles on it since the complete restoration. Um, and then it sat for many, many years in his home uh, before being purchased and shipped here by Hall Bikes. Um, if you guys are looking for somebody to do any shipping for motorcycles, new or old Hall Bikes uh, is great. I can wholeheartedly recommend them. We've used them a number of times. This is not a paid advertisement for Hall Bikes, uh, but I would use them again and again. Uh, right now, we've Put some new fuel in it. We're using 100 low lead aviation fuel uh, as these bikes don't really like ethanol. If you have an old motorcycle, keep the ethanol fuel out of it, car, anything. Just keep ethanol away from everything uh, that uses a carburetor. Uh, this bike started after a lot of um, prodding and playing and, and doing. Um, had to take the carburetor apart and ultrasonically clean it. It was stored with fuel in the carb. It was pretty corroded. All the jets were cleaned out. We are ordering new jets and new gaskets uh, for it, but currently we have it running fairly well with the, uh, the original components that are in the carb. We are having an issue right now where it's not producing enough oil pressure to push oil up to the top of the heads and out to the valve train. So what I need to do now is translate this original workshop manual from German to English. It has all the information in here about the adjustable oil breather uh, inside the engine, on the front end of the engine. It's kind of hard to see here. I'll post a better photo of it um, on screen here be below. And I have to take off the entire charging system and ignition system, which is actually an aftermarket electronic ignition uh, that was installed that I had to go through and statically time uh, with very poor instructions. So that was super fun. It uses a BMW Slash 2 style ignition advanced unit. Uh, it's almost identical to what's found on a earlier Slash 2 uh, from BMW, um, same time period-ish uh, on there. So. I'll give a close up of exactly what going on, what's going on. We'll start the motorcycle and you can kind of see uh, what's going on with the oiling system. It's also building, I think, too much pressure and blowing oil out through the bottom of the crankcase vent and it'll create a puddle here on the bench after it's run for a short period of time. Uh, so I think all of that will be rectified with uh, checking the breather. It's possible there's a blockage inside of the engine. I'm really hoping that's not it. I really do not want to tear down a Victoria Bergmeister V35 engine uh, with this poor workshop manual that seems to be the standard uh, for everything. So we will see what we've got. So according to the manual, it's all in German by the way, uh, this is what the oil breather, uh, the crankcase breather looks like. It is adjustable. Uh, so I have sent the pages here that contain the crankcase breather to my sister in Germany for translation. I'm really hoping that this is the problem, is that the breather's just not set right, but if you see here, the closer you look, you get into the engine, he used a lot of form a gasket, make a gasket, whatever you want to call it, orange RTV, red RTV, to seal everything. So I have my suspicions that there's possibly a blocked oil passage somewhere uh, along the line somewhere. I mean, everything has been formigasketed or, or RTV'd. Um, I have found a website in Germany that does have gasket kits for this motorcycle. Uh, and we will kind of be going from, you know, going from there, finding out what we need, get it ordered and uh, get it coming uh, from Germany. Okay, so we'll start it up and see, I'll get the camera over here, I have my phone camera, and we'll take a look and I can show everybody what I mean when I say we're not getting enough oil at the top end. So for this, we'll turn the fuel on, and straight down, tickle the carb about three times, 
turn the key on, choke, crack the throttle just a teeny tiny bit. Ton of positive crankcase pressure with the bike uh, when you do run it. So we will disassemble the front of the engine uh, and check out the crankcase breather and see how it's set. Okay, so what we're going to do first is remove the timing port plug. I'm actually going to see if I can find a nicer one. Uh, this one is, I believe, plated with cadmium, um, and the cadmium is worn off and pitting. Uh, see if either I have to send it out and get it replated, or if I can find another one. I really don't like to use reproduction parts, but if any of you have ever sent something out for CAD plating in the not-so-distant past, you know how expensive that is. So this bike is so nice, if we can't find a reproduction, we will be replating, and I will have a probably a few other things to go out to the CAD plater as well. Now what we'll do is take your 11 millimeter ratchet and we'll turn this over, watching exhaust. Now the intake valve's opening. And I'll watch the hole here come back up. RZ and OT, and then we'll have play in the valve train at that point, making sure that this cylinder is on TDC. So I want to make sure I always, whether it's a BMW, something exotic like this, um, anything, I always put the left hand cylinder on TDC before I do anything with the timing, anything at the front of the engine. That way you just always have a baseline to go back to. So now what we'll do is we'll go over here and we'll make a couple of marks to make sure that we can get the mag body back in the correct location after we disassemble everything and check that breather. So here's an interesting thing I found when I pulled the advance off, which I will be rebuilding, is that this spring that controls the rate of timing advance is actually broken. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on the bike you can see there's a directional arrow. It's very similar to a slash two advance. So I am actually wondering if it is a slash two advance or it's the same thing and one of these springs will work. If it is a slash two advance, you know both springs are not the same. There is a different spring on each side and you set the limit uh, with the tabs. So we'll kind of do a little bit of research into that and see if I can figure that out next. Okay, so we have the wiring removed from the ignition. I made note of what goes where and took photos. Put that over here. Now I've loosened these three mag body plate bolts. So we'll pull these out. See if we can't get the mag body to come off. Also, the mag body bolts are all different lengths so far. I'm betting this is the same length.
Okay, so the mag body's out. I shouldn't call it the mag body, the ignition body, I guess, at this point, because there's no mag anymore, uh, is out. And we can see everything here. And we can see the rotor. And these brushes look brand new, which is great. But we're still not to the oil pump, I'm sorry, the oil breather unit yet. So I'm betting I gotta pull that rotor and pull this front cover off, which I'm not really looking forward to. Because the manual is not exactly clear about kind of what's behind it, how to get it off, all the above. But this is part of having uh, vintage Exotica and having a vintage motorcycle shop, working on bikes that they didn't make many of and there's not a whole lot of information left for. Um, it looks to me uh, in the manual, like I loosen or I take all these nuts off and we heat it up and pull it off uh, and kind of go from there. So let's give it a go. Okay, so we're gonna measure the depth of the hole on this rotor. It's just, uh, what I'm using here is a carb cleaner can straw, making sure there's no hole that anything can go into uh, the crank for whatever reason, it's not hollow or anything. Um, in here, and I'm gonna mark that like this, and we'll measure it and see what depth we need. So that depth is right around 86 millimeters. So we'll add another 15 millimeters to that so that we don't bottom out the head of the bolt, maybe 20 millimeters uh, on that so we don't bottom out the head of the bolt. Uh, while it's pulling the rotor out. I also don't want to make it so long that I have to pull the motorcycle out of the wheel shock and turn the handlebars and end up having to strap the back of the bike down and see if we can get it to the correct length where I can make the turn and get it in here first. Work smarter, not harder. Okay, so I actually found in another manual at the bottom of the box uh, for the charging system here. They actually just have you use the rotor retention bolt and uh, a spacer um, that I calculated the length for uh, based on having correct purchase uh, on the threads and measuring to the bottom of the crank unit uh, and got that rotor off without having to really fabricate a whole nother threaded pulling tool. I just made a spacer for, uh, you know, for the bolt that was supplied with it like they have here in the manual. Okay, so we have the rotor off uh, with that spacer that I fabricated using the stock retention bolt. I could have also, like I had said earlier, have a longer puller fabricated uh, made at the machine shop, but this was a lot quicker and a lot less expensive, and it worked just fine. So we're going to place this out of the way here. It is located on the shaft with a keyway. I'm going to remove so we don't lose it. And now I'm going to take off these, uh, these nuts and remove the front cover uh, from the engine. I'm a little bit nervous, uh, but I think we'll be all right. I, don't, I, I studied the drawings and anything else I could find online of pictures of the engine apart to see what was behind there. And I think it just, it's gonna just have to come off one way or another. I'm going to lightly heat it uh, before I start trying to get it off. The gentleman who restored it, unfortunately used kind of like gasket sealer to seal everything because I don't think a gasket kit was available or readily available at the time he restored this bike. So he kind of had to use what he, what he had. Um, like I said earlier, I'm also worried about the gasket sealant, the you know, form a gasket that he used here, the uh, Red RTV to seal up the top end. I'm still not convinced that it's not clogged uh, in the top here, but it's a lot easier to pull the front of this off and a lot less time consuming to pull the front of this engine off uh, than it is to remove both the, uh, both the heads 
both the cylinders and you know remove the exhaust and it's a lot less invasive. Okay, before going any further, um, I am going to tape up the frame now because once we start rocking and rolling and pulling that cover off, anything can happen. And I'd rather be safe than sorry. Especially because this paint is absolutely immaculate and I'd like to keep it that way. I'm sure the owner will too. Okay, to remove these, I'm gonna be using my favorite electric ratchet from Snap-on. It's the 14.4 volt. Let's see if there's a part number on it. Charlie Tango Romeo 714 Alpha is the model number. Um, I use this all the time here in the shop. It's been excellent. I've used it every single day, all day, uh, for quite a while now. Uh, I can't imagine getting along without it. The batteries are great. They have a magnetic base. It's got plenty of power for what I do. I'd be great for guys with, you know, in a body shop doing, you know, trim panels or anything interior for the car. Or for me, I use a ton of the 14.4 volt quarter inch drive uh, electric tools from Snap-on. I absolutely can't say enough good things about them. I am not sponsored by Snap-on, but I would like to be. So Snap-on, if you are uh, watching this or anybody is watching this, I'd love some free stuff. Okay, so we have all the nuts off, everything's removed, everything's off the front cover that could stop it from coming off the front of the engine. Um, in the manual, they list a special three-sided puller that goes on each one of these posts here, two, three, and pushes against the crank nose, and that's removed from the front. Um, I don't have one. I'd love to have one. Uh, I am thinking I might have a puller that will work, but if it's anything like the BMW front covers, they have a puller for that. If you know what you're doing, you don't need it. Uh, you heat up around the bearing that the crank rides on. Here you get it to about 190 to 230 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and it should just come right off. Uh, the whole thing just kind of removes, maybe with one or two little taps from a soft hammer, such as this one here. Um, these are great. Also from Snap-on, uh, really well made. This is a Hotel Bravo Papa Tango 24, 24 ounce soft hammer. And I also will heat it up with the little snap-on butane torch. I lost the part number off of this, but they have a larger one and a smaller one. This is the larger one, it refills with butane. This has been the, uh, one of the best little torches I've ever had. Uh, really, really handy, really, really useful. So let's get that warmed up and see if I can get it to come off without the puller. If it gives me any kind of real resistance, we're going to stop, obviously, uh, and we'll kind of reevaluate and make something, uh, make a tool to get that off.
We're getting there. Try and give it a little tap. Well, it looks like we are definitely going to need a puller. Uh, the trick that I know from Airheads did not work. Uh, I kind of was hoping it would, but you know, such is life uh, here in the shop. So I'm going to go and get the parts needed to fabricate uh, the correct puller and we will be back when I have that all done. Okay, so I did get the front cover off. Uh, I had decided to give it a little bit more heat and bring it up to about 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it actually ended up coming right off uh, at that point, which is great. Um, there was a lot of RTV used to seal it up, which is not my favorite thing to use for any motorcycle application where there's a gasket available or where it originally came with a gasket. Uh, I am going to be making a gasket, paper gasket, to go in place of this. The only thing is, is that I think I might see now as I'm recording this, uh, why they used a RTV instead of a paper gasket. And that is because the mating surfaces here are not perfect. Uh, it's a little bit beat up, it's got some scoring. I mean, it is from 1954 and who knows who did what to maintain this thing while it was in service. Um, you know, we're kinda doing some archeological mechanicing here. We have to kinda decode why things were done at what period of time and if it was done for a reason that can't be circumnavigated or circumvented. Uh, and for this one here, I found some other disturbing stuff when I pulled it out, which is some sludge in here in all the lower portions of this cover. It's got a lot of metal in it. So there's also quite a bit of metal in the oil and the sludge down here. But it is a freshly built, rebuilt engine. It is possible that it was bedding itself in, it's breaking in. Every motor produces some amount of metal, no matter how minuscule, there's still some metal being produced as it runs. Uh, but this is a little bit more than I would really like to see um, on an engine that I ran for a total of five minutes. Uh, and I'm pretty sure everybody else, you know, the bike had four miles on it when it came in the shop and I have not ridden it down the road. I've only started it and ran it to confirm that we were not getting enough oil to the top end to make sure the bike ran. Uh, so now what I need to do is the breather is here inside this front cover up here. Uh, according to the manual, I believe this is where the breather is located. 
um, get that out. I think I need to heat that cover up and remove it like I did for removing the front cover from the, from the motorcycle uh, and kind of figure out exactly what we've got going on here. Uh, the oil pump uh, is here and I think I will be pulling that oil pump off and inspecting the rotors and the, and the pump itself and kind of measure it and see what kind of tolerances we're at and see if it needs to be rebuilt, replaced. I hope it doesn't need to be replaced. I don't know if I can get another one or if we'll have to have one made again across the street at the machine shop. All right, so I did a bunch of digging online, called a few people. Uh, thanks again to Todd Trumbor. Uh, he owns a Bergmeister here locally, ironically, uh, semi-locally, about an hour away from me. And I spoke with him at length about the oiling issue and the breather issue. And after kind of getting his take on it and reviewing the manual and some other stuff I found online, um, the breather was actually set up improperly, not allowing any crankcase pressure to be relieved. So this, you can hear as I suck on the, the breather tube, it allows plenty of air to pass. Uh, it was actually flipped where it was the opposite when uh, it wouldn't allow any air out. Um, or I'm sorry, any, any, yeah, any air out and plenty of air in on the backstroke and uh, that kind of messed with everything. And I'm, I'm willing to bet that that was making it difficult for the oil pump to stay primed. Uh, the oil pump is down here. Um, I'm also going to pull the oil pan off and check the oil pickup screen. There's actually a filter in the pan. Um, and I'm going to pull that out and check that here in just a moment. Uh, but I'm pretty confident that adjusting the breather, I wish I'd videoed it, I apologize, I didn't. I had to warm this up and get the breather out and check everything and then kind of put the breather back in. Uh, and now it is operating as it should. Uh, the breather setup procedure is actually fairly complicated and fairly involved. Um, I can go over that in another video if somebody wanted me to. I don't really know how many other people are gonna be out there looking for how to set up the oil breather, the crankcase breather on their Bergmeister V35, um, but I'm happy to do it if you're out there. Uh, so let's get the oil pan pulled off and the sludge checked and check for any more metal or any other particulates uh, that the engine may be producing. One other thing I'll show you guys is my lift is an Atlas electric over hydraulic and it goes higher than any other motorcycle lift I've ever seen. And uh, it is completely silent. I hate air compressors. I hate listening to them. I hate dealing with them and I hate hissing air lines. Uh, so in the shop here, I don't have any of that. I have electric impacts. I have a small snap-on electric tire inflator to do tires. I don't change tires here in the shop. I farm that out to a third party. Uh, I hate doing it. There's no money to be made in tires in a motorcycle shop my size, a restoration shop like this. So I let other people handle that and deal with the noisy, nasty compressor issue. So here we will pull off these 10 millimeter bolts that hold the oil pan on. I'm gonna leave this open for a moment here in the front and uh, I'll get to making a gasket. I might even do that tonight at the house. I haven't decided yet. I might take this home and do that while I'm sitting at the kitchen table. Uh, and see what we've got inside. So again, I'll be using my favorite electric ratchet. It's quite long. I'm gonna make sure I place them in order around the pan so I know what came from where. I'm gonna take it off in kind of a cross pattern.
So one other thing I do like to use here in the shop are these job trays, I'm gonna call them. I get these from Harbor Freight. I think they're like six or seven bucks. There's a few different versions of them. There's ones with all vertical sections. There's kind, this kind is the one I like with the small individual pieces here. Uh, and every time I do a job, I kind of take everything off in order uh, and put them in the individual small tray here. Uh, for this one here, I'm gonna move this over here with the rotor, put all the oil pan bolts in here. These are really kind of a unique bolt washer and uh, retaining washer setup. And I'm gonna get my soft hammer and uh, put a rag over it. And I'm gonna give it a couple of taps and break that gasket loose. Okay, I'm gonna grab my soft hammer and wrap it. comes. So we had one washer stuck to the bottom still here, toss that in with the other ones. Uh, but I'm seeing a lot of sludge in here, like a lot of sludge, a lot, a lot. Um, I'll get my other camera over here and I'll show you exactly what I'm finding here. There's just a lot of nasty, nasty, nasty crud in, at the bottom of this pan here. Uh, it's not at all Really calm, but it's inspiring. So I'm gonna get this off and check out my filter in here and see what's going on with that. Okay, so here's what I found when I dropped the pan. Not great. Very sludgy. There's a lot of metal in here. Not super confidence inspiring. I'm wondering if they didn't do a very good job cleaning the engine out after media blasting it or after vapor honing it or whatever they did. Okay, so I got the oil filter out, uh, which is kind of unique. It's like a stack of very thinly spaced uh, metal rings. This goes up in there first. Then this, then this, and that's just kind of how it rides in there. And then the nut secures it onto the oil pickup tube. So it did have, I wish I could have kept it on there. It kind of came off in my hands as I was kind of running it through my fingers. It does have a lot of RTV in it. Um, not a whole lot of particulates, which I think is you know, for the best, or is it, you know, at least it was getting some oil. Uh, it's a little bit clogged. I'm actually going to put it through my uh, ultrasonic cleaner um, and see if that'll get a lot of it and loosen it up. I actually think I'm going to put the, uh, clean out the oil pan and put that through my ultrasonic cleaner as well. I think that would take care of it a lot better than just scrubbing it for 45 minutes or more with a simple green foaming barbecue degreaser or you know, something along those lines to try and get that all out of there. Uh, we'll see how the ultrasonic cleaner does and see if I can't get a hold of a new filter element or if there's an updated paper filter or something I can find online that's a match. All right, now I got oil pan nice and clean. I still have to remove some of the gasket material. And I'm going to use one of my favorite tools uh, that I purchased recently. It's a cobalt gasket scraper, uh, again from Snap-on. So this is part number Charlie Sierra Sierra Delta One. Uh, these are great. You can push on steel and pull on aluminum. Do not, there's the train. Do not push on aluminum. You will gouge it, remove material, be really sorry, have to do something horrible, like take that part that you were trying to clean, take it to a machine shop and have it decked if you gouge it enough. Uh, so for this, I just very lightly drag it. Do not push and it'll take the majority of the RTV off 
or the old gasket off. And then I use Scotch-Brite or something like that. Uh, I do not use cookie wheels. I do not use a die grinder. I do not use any other of the uh, automatic or, or you know, air-driven or electric-driven drill to remove it. I've just seen too many problems result from people trying to go too quickly on bikes like this, antique cars, aircraft engines, you name it. Just slow down and you'll end up doing yourself a big favor and saving yourself a lot of money and aggravation in the end. Okay, so it's the end of the day today. Um, it's about 5, 10. Uh, I'm ready to go home and we've made a lot of progress today on the Bergmeister. Uh, we determined quite a few things. Determined that there is a lot of debris in the pan, uh, a lot of debris in the pan, that the breather was improperly assembled and causing the crankcase to build positive pressure and most likely is what's causing the oil pump, pump either not to be able to push oil all the way up to the top, uh, not prime properly. Uh, we removed the oil filter and uh, are gonna have that clean for tomorrow. Uh, we'll start that process in the morning. We're going to finish cleaning up the mating surfaces. I'm all out of Scotch-Brite. I gotta stop and get some on the way in tomorrow morning. I'll probably hit Advance, AutoZone, something, uh, and get that. Because Home Depot was out the other day when I went to go pick something up, which has been another fun thing, you know, owning a, uh, and, and managing and trying to keep everything sorted here with a one-man operation. Uh, for a vintage motorcycle shop is trying to keep the shop fully stocked uh, with the supply shortages and everything else that's going on in my area in the greater Philadelphia area. So tomorrow's project is going to be getting all of this resealed. We'll go over doing that. We'll get the oil filter reinstalled. We'll get the timing cover put back on again. We'll get the bike fully reassembled, uh, refilled with oil and get it started up and see if we can't get some more oil to the top end. I'm not gonna run it for very long. If it doesn't supply oil to the top end how I expect it to or what I'm happy with, uh, we will have to begin the process of removing the top end, which I really, really don't want to do if we don't have to. Hoping we don't. So thank you everybody for tuning into the first episode uh, here at the channel um, for me here at the shop Wheaton Motor Works. I'm Clayton Wheaton. Thank you very much for watching and tuning in. And uh, check back again for the next video. Thanks.